I guess you could say I was a weird kid. I went through a lot of obsessions in my early life, phases where I would become obsessed with a topic for a couple of months and learn everything I possibly could about it until inevitably something else would catch my attention and I would move on. When I was around 10 years old, at a school book fair, a book with a large ship on its cover caught my eye. After glancing over the first few pages, I decided I would use the $10 my parents had given me to spend at the fair on one single book. Reading it would cement my fanatical interest in the ship that decorated the cover, the Titanic. Over the next couple of months, I would devour and be able to regurgitate from memory countless facts about the ship, from the time it was being built in Belfast to its untimely sinking in the North Atlantic that April night in 1912. I even managed to successfully annoy my parents into renting the huge blockbuster hit that had come out about it just a few years prior and letting me watch it, albeit with them skipping over some scenes. Time moved on and eventually I found a new topic to occupy my interest and I largely forgot about the Titanic. Although, to this day, I do still remember several facts which once even came in handy at a happy hour trivia night when I was in school for my PhD. I did eventually grow up and become a far less obsessive person, finding just one interest to occupy my time and eventually blossom into my career. Microbiology. I had studied it in college and decided to go to graduate school for it and am currently a professor at a relatively impressive private university which I will leave nameless for privacy's sake, and I'm able to pursue my passion, with the relatively light compromise of having to lecture often hung over students about basic microbiology. I was working from home one night, as my wife was preparing dinner, when I got a call from a colleague at a different university, who I've collaborated with before. Again, for privacy, I've altered our names. Matt? I said, answering the phone. Hey Dennis, how have you been? After a couple of minutes exchanging pleasantries, Matt got to the reason he called. I'm about to conduct a study to see what kind of bacteria tend to inhabit shipwrecks. There are a lot of sites for us to handle, and I won't be able to analyse all the samples on my own. Would you want to help out? I understand that to the general public, anything that would come out of that study would be the equivalent to a couple of sleeping pills. For us though, it was pretty exciting. Yeah, of course. I answered. Just let me know when you send the samples my way and I'll keep an eye out for them. There was a pause afterwards. Actually, we would have to go in person. It's a few wrecks, some classical age stuff in the Mediterranean, some World War I vessels in the Baltic. I did get approval actually today for the Titanic, which I wasn't expecting. Dennis continued to drone on and on about how he had to fill out countless forms and basically learn to speak Lithuanian in order to complete the necessary paperwork but all I could notice is that my curiosity had been piqued. I hadn't thought about the Titanic in a long time, but an opportunity was presented for me to visit the site itself. I agreed. The next few months were relatively busy, with all the preparations needed to go on these expeditions. First, it was a lot of reading on bacteria native to the sites we were visiting, as well as what previous studies of a similar nature discovered. Then there were also the protocols on operating the submersible vehicle that we'd be in. I was told that I was learning all this mostly for emergencies, as the submarines would all be manned by someone with two decades of experience in doing so. Before I knew it, I was saying goodbye to my wife and flying from North America to Ukraine, where the vessel was currently stationed. I met Dennis in the port of Odessa, where we spent a day catching up and comparing what pre-existing literature we found on the topic. The next day, we went to the docks to check out what would be our floating home for the next few weeks. The boat itself wasn't the most modern, but wasn't exactly outdated either. It had decent enough facilities for all of us, including our own private rooms, as well as a place to prepare food and lavatories. The owner of the boat, who also happened to be the captain, was a Ukrainian guy named Andre. His English wasn't the best, but he knew enough to be able to communicate and honestly, most of his communication was done through his facial features. You could always tell what he thought of what was being said by his eye rolls or smiles. We were also accompanied by a couple of technicians, mostly Ukrainians and Russians, who spoke no English. They were mainly responsible for the maintenance of the vessel, as well as the two submersible vehicles, 
able to fit three persons each. The first three weeks were simple enough, uneventful to the point of being boring honestly. We showed up to the sites of the wrecks, descended in the submersibles, and managed to acquire enough samples from the wrecks as well as surrounding water to see what were growing agar plates back in the lab. After dealing with our last site in the Baltic Sea, our course was set. The North Atlantic, almost 400 miles off the southern tip of Newfoundland to the wreck of the Titanic. It took a couple days for us to get there, mainly passed by drinking hard liquor in amounts that I hadn't seen since college and by playing cards, which was interesting when we couldn't fully communicate with everyone due to the language barrier. We reached the coordinates closer to the evening and it was decided we would go down to the wreckage first thing in the morning. As we were getting ready that night, Dennis received an email from a colleague of his to have a video chat. Assuming that this was going to be something microbiology related, Dennis asked me to join in. The first few minutes of talking with his colleague went about as expected. She was very friendly, and mainly it was just some introductions and small talk between the three of us, with her asking how our fieldwork was going so far, and Dennis asking how everything was going back at the university at home. Nothing too out of the ordinary. Then, the smile began to vanish from her face. Listen, she said. I heard you guys are going down to the Titanic. That's right, Dennis replied. I've never been there myself personally, but I know people who have. Some people who've gone down there a few times. It's... there's... Listen, just do me a favor. Don't spend more time than you have to out there. What? I asked, confused. Just... Trust me on this, don't spend too much time down there, and promise me, please promise me, that if you think you see something moving, don't look. Dennis and I were both dumbfounded. Was this some sort of joke? I don't understand, Rose, Dennis started. I can't explain it myself. Like I said, I've never been down there. I just know people who have. Just be safe down there. It's way deeper than all the other wrecks you guys have gone to, and it's way far out from everything. Be safe. I... Okay, we'll be fine. I'll see you back at the lab in about a week. With that, Dennis signed off. We exchanged glances. There was no doubt between us. That conversation took a very weird turn. Dennis appeared to be a little shaken, but made some comments under his breath that Rose was very smart but also had a reputation of being a bit eccentric. We went to the dining table and passed some time playing cards with Andre and the maintenance team. The next morning, I met Dennis and Andre on the deck as we made our way into the submersible. It was slightly cramped for three people, but it made little sense to take down both just to have some more leg room. With three of us inside, the vehicle began its descent down. It did become slightly unnerving. All the previous wrecks were not so deep that there wasn't at least a little bit of sunlight. But here, after some point, it was pitch black. We turned on the lights, both inside and outside the submersible, and, after some more time, it appeared. The bow came out of the darkness, just as it did in all the pictures and movies that you've probably seen. It nearly took me by surprise. I was so enamoured by the darkness that I forgot that we were visiting a wreckage site. But, there she was. The Titanic. Never, not even in my wildest dreams as a ten-year-old, reading every Titanic book I could get my hands on, did I think I would ever be able to see the wreckage for myself. The romanticism of the moment faded, as I remembered the reason we were there. Collecting wreckage and water samples. We started at the very tip of the bow, and worked our way down the wreckage. We scraped off some of the rust and organic matter that had accumulated on the railings, as well as samples of water right around the wreck. As we were making our way towards the back of the wreckage, I saw Andre turn his head with a confused look on his face. Neither of us said anything, but at some point, Andre shrugged his shoulders and we continued on with our work. We kept making our way to the back, and at least twice I saw Andre turn his head and appear to look out into the darkness. Andre, is something wrong? I asked. Dennis turned so that we were both facing Andre while he was able to look past us out towards the wreckage. Is nothing. I just... Andre stopped mid-sentence. We stared at him, 
waiting for him to continue on. But he just kept staring, with a blank expression on his face. I glanced over at Dennis with a worried look, one that he reciprocated. As I turned my gaze back at Andre, his eyes got wide. And he screamed. Andre had a deep and booming scream, and the fact that we were in a tiny, enclosed metallic space made his scream and echo all the more painful. As Dennis and I jammed our ears shut with our hands, Andre lunged forward, grabbing a hammer from the always open toolkit, and smashed the light switch repeatedly. The lights were out, and we were in pitch black darkness, and Andre finally stopped screaming. He was eerily quiet, and the fact that we couldn't see anything only made it that much more unnerving. M M Matt? Dennis stuttered. I'm here, Andre? There was no response. Andre, we need to get back to the surface. Please, can you do that for us? I asked. No response. I could feel Andre's presence there. Obviously, there was nowhere for him to go. But still, I got no response. Andre, please. I felt him stir a little bit and move in the direction of the control board. I heard him start to fumble around. He was probably having issue due to the darkness. As we were waiting for something, anything to happen that could convince us that this wasn't going to be our resting place as well, we felt something ram into the submersible, forcing two different expletives out of both Dennis and I. We heard Andre continue to fumble around with the controls. Andre, please, we need to get out of here, Dennis said, his voice breaking with fear and desperation. Please! Again, the submersible shook as something unseen rammed into it. Dennis's voice was breaking with tears, as was mine, as we pleaded Andre to do something to get us out of there. As we heard a tapping coming from all possible sides of the submersible, we also heard a familiar and comforting sound, that of the vehicle ascending. It went slower than we remembered it at the other wrecks. I'm not sure if it was because the submersible was actually damaged, or if it just seemed that way because we were so scared. Not too much longer, we were able to see clearly again as we reached shallow enough water, as we reached shallow enough water that the sun's rays were able to reach us. As I was beginning to appreciate my newly found ability to see once more, Dennis screamed. I turned my head to see what he was screaming at, and when I saw it too, I couldn't help but scream myself. Andre was dead. As I looked away to avoid looking at Andre's body, I saw something else that made my stomach drop. Handprints, all over the vehicle's front window, large and small ones, covering nearly every single inch. Eventually, we reached the surface of the water and were retrieved by Andre's crew. After they saw what had happened, it was a frenzy on the boat. As soon as I stepped out of the submersible and onto the boat, I threw up. Once I finished, I looked back at the submersible to see that every inch of it, not just the windows, were covered in those handprints. Despite being drained, I had to be the one who was in communication with the Canadian Coast Guard since Dennis had locked himself in his room and none of the crew spoke English. The Canadians were able to send someone over to pick up Dennis and I the next day, after which we never spoke again. I tried to see what information I was able to pick up about Andre as I was sure an autopsy would be carried out on what appeared to be an otherwise healthy middle-aged man. It took some digging, but I found that his death had been ruled by a coroner back in Ukraine as what appeared to be a, quote, stress-induced heart attack. We never analysed the data that we got from all those wrecks, although I did work up the courage to open the samples that we did retrieve from the Titanic and characterise those bacteria that were present. For the most part, the bacteria that we found were what would be expected in deep, cold and frigid water, although, as I was going through the data, I did notice that the samples that we acquired as we went further along the wreck of the Titanic started to have increasing levels of bacteria that were typically present in another environment. They were bacteria that are typically associated with decaying bodies. <laughs>